This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 45. Follow up on Micro Power Radio. This is the uh, Micro Power Radio uh, talk. This is the version 2.0. Uh, I'm going to kind of cover a little bit of some of the things I covered last year, plus some changes that have occurred legally. Put my Nets hat on to keep my hair out of my eyes. Um, as well as try to go over some technical details that uh, I kind of glossed over last year. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Professor Fiedelbaum. I am uh, the individual that uh, started the Desert Crossing radio broadcasts five years ago uh, with the Southern California Car Caravan. I also operated my own micropower radio station in the Los Angeles area called The Voice of Mercury for a number of months or years. Uh, probably closer to eight years now. Um, I have since moved. I'm no longer in Southern California, so I'm not necessarily involved with the caravan anymore. Uh, I'm in a new town, causing new problems on new frequencies. Uh, basically, what I hope to cover is a little bit of some of the changes that have occurred in the last year regarding micropower radio. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about antenna construction. Um, I'm going to... Uh, discuss a little bit about building a pirate station, kind of recover some of the stuff that I covered last year. Uh, first of all, some changes. First of all, right now, currently before the Federal Communications Commission is a proposal to provide for legal micropower radio. Uh, on January 28, the FCC has proposed to license new 1,000 watt and 100 watt low power FM stations and has also seeking comments to establish a third class for power levels from 1 to 10 watts. Um, the, of course, the National Association of Broadcasters isn't real happy about this. They would much rather have uh, one or two companies owning stations and markets rather than hundreds of companies, um, as is the case like in the town where I live, where there are 16 FM stations owned by three companies. Uh, this, of course, reduces the quantity of people that have a voice in the market, especially in urban areas like Los Angeles, um, where it is very difficult to get on the air. They have adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking, which basically means that the FCC is seriously considering this proposal, and they are accepting comments. Now, the original comment period expired uh, April 12th, but has been extended now twice. Uh, they are currently still taking comments until August 2nd. I'm actually looking at the proposal here on, the, on their website. And uh, there is a website you can go to if you would like to see the uh, LPFM proposal. And let me find that here in my notes as I'm paging up here. Um, and I don't appear to have the actual URL in here. But uh, I think if you go to FCC.gov, www.fcc.gov, and uh, look for the LPFM proposal, um, basically the low power FM proposal that's being sent, that's being discussed right now is not perfect. Um, a lot of people in the micro power radio community would have much rather had some additional restrictions based on ownership and things like that. Um, but uh, this is better than nothing and uh, should, should prove at least interesting for the short term. Um, I just want to make a couple of things known. There's a couple of, uh, uh, there's a little bit of FUD going around on this. They're not issuing licenses yet, nor are they accepting applications. And the commission is seriously considering the fact that people that have been busted for operating micropower stations in the past will not be issued licenses um, because they are, quote, unfit broadcasters, unquote. Um, that's one of the more... Uh, E questionable issues. Obviously, this is uh, some people think this is specifically so that Dunifer, uh for those of you who don't know, Stephen Dunifer is like the godfather of uh, micropower radio. Uh, a lot of people think there's a conspiracy to keep him off the air, and that's why the FCC is doing that. Um, 
anyway, like I said, you, um, they're taking citizen comments on this. I strongly suggest that everybody who's even remotely interested in MicroPower Radio go to the FCC's website, find this proposal, send in your comments, not only through the web, but send them by mail. Like every other bureaucracy, they're going to take web comments and put them in the circular file, only counting them. However, mail comments are going to be obviously more considered than web comments and email comments. Um, that's the, that's the current legal status of power, Micropower Radio. The FCC has been still shutting down stations for last year. Uh, last year when uh, I started talking, they had just finished uh, taking off about 10 stations. They're still taking them off the air. Uh, <laughs> what this means long term, I don't know, but uh, the short of it is, is that, uh, and this kind of is the disclaimer, if you do this, uh, you do run the chances of getting caught. And uh, we'll want to, of course, protect yourself accordingly. Uh, let's see. Getting to the thing. Oh, I might as well talk a little bit about the Dunifer Free Radio Berkeley um, decision. Um, I don't have all the notes here on this, so uh, if somebody knows a little bit more, feel free to stop me. But uh, basically, the, uh, the Free Radio Berkeley, which was kind of the parent micro power station, um, has been taken off the air pretty much for good. They continue broadcasting sometimes on wild frequencies in the Bay Area. Um, this, of course, has been hampered by the fact that Dunifer's physical health has deteriorated. Um, there are appeals pending, but uh, the general consensus is, is that with the low power FM proposal on the table, uh, the, FCC now ha the FCC now has much more of a case. Because before in the case, Dunifer's defense was based on the fact that you cannot apply for a license. There isn't even a process to go through to be denied. They just will not accept them. With this micropower radio proposal, now the FCC's defense, now the FCC can say, well, yes, there is. There's this notice of proposed rulemaking, and we'll be taking license applications applications in six months and why are you on the air so that's kind of been why a lot of people think the LPFM proposal got as far as it did um, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens in six months from now uh, see where this proposal actually goes it's curious that uh, uh, all this is going on now um, right before the election go fig I guess micropower radio isn't really an election priority uh, okay, kind of glanced over that. Let's uh, talk about actually putting a pirate radio station on the air. Um, the obvious things you need to put a pirate station on the air are obviously programming, which is your mixer and all that fancy stuff, which we have plenty of up here. Um, you need a transmitter of some sort, and you need an antenna to radiate your signal. Those are the three basic components. Um, Obviously, all the audio gear is very easy to obtain. Uh, a trip to your local Radio Shack store or your, even a pro audio store such as, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the place. Sam Ash used to be the name of it, or I think they were bought up by somebody. Or a place like that will get you all the gear you need, at least as far as the audio is concerned. Transmitter is a little harder to obtain. Uh, TP, is uh, Brewer still operating? I don't know. There used to be a gentleman in Florida by the name of L.D. Brewer, um, does www.ldbrewer.com, that used to sell um, kits. And for about $200, you could purchase a uh, Panaxis FM exciter and um, a Free Radio Berkeley like 60 watt kit to get to get yourself about 60 watts of uh, of power. Uh, Obviously, we need to have a little bit of electronic skills to build this. These come as kits almost exclusively. Um, the electronic skills you need are nothing simpler than just knowing how to solder. Um, in a few cases, you might want to pick up some skills in um, basic radio troubleshooting. Um, anybody who has taken uh, a technician level ham radio class probably has all of the technical know-how you need to do it. Um, most of the technical issues that you'll have are just construction. A lot of the kits, especially the Free Radio Berkeley kits, are designed to be assembled by people who have learned how to solder as early as five minutes ago. Um, so it's uh, pretty, pretty easy to actually build the transmitter. Building an antenna is a little more complicated in the sense that it does require some actual construction skills. Um, we have successfully 
in previous years transmitted using an antenna very similar to this one. This is actually a Radio Shack right off the shelf CB antenna. Um, these can actually be readily modified for um, the FM broadcast band. It does require a little bit of, uh, of skill. In fact, you'll probably break your first one. We did. <laughs> actually, we didn't. It's on the air. It works. Oh, it works. Basically, what you have to do, these are designed for a much lower frequency. So while that antenna is actually pretty close for the FM broadcast band, there's a loading coil inside here, which makes the antenna electrically a lot longer. Um, this loading coil needs to be removed, and it can be removed by basically unbolting it and uh, taking it apart. You will have to take this plastic stuff off. There's a magnet under here, and there's a bolt. Um, once that coil is removed, uh, it's pretty much you're ready to go. You need to make contact with a vehicle to stick it to, because the vehicle acts as part of the antenna, and uh, this is the radiating element. And uh, it's that simple. It takes an afternoon to build an antenna that way. <laughs> you do have to have metal-to-metal -metal contact between the base and the antenna. Um, it, you can you can get away with having, like, it doesn't have to be direct metal contact. It can be inductive contact. In other words, if this is sitting on, see this is plastic, so obviously there's not, there's a little bit of insulation here, but it does have to be pretty much directly on something metal with very little in between it. Um, if you have a vinyl top, for example, that's too much. Besides, the magnet probably wouldn't hold. The rule of thumb on that is if the magnet holds, there'll be inductive contact. Um, since we're dealing with radio, we don't necessarily have to touch metal. We just have to get close enough so that there's not you know, a, additional inductance going on between the two. Um, but um, I've, I've, when I built mine, I have an antenna very similar to this. I built mine out of a different model Radio Shack antenna. And when I did it, I found out that just taking a piece of copper foil and sticking it on here improved the antenna performance. Um, your mileage may vary because Radio Shack has changed these antennas twice in the last, like, five years. So, um, but the basic design of it's the same. This is pretty close. Um, we had to trim it a little bit, didn't we? Like right around here, a little bit longer. Right about that, shorter, right there. That was for 104.7 megahertz. Um, as you increase in frequency, the antenna's longer. A um, little bit quick notes about antenna design. Um, you will want to probably, like I said, pick up a little bit of knowledge about how long this needs to be. There's a mathematical formula. Uh, and I can't for the time for me to remember it because I'm way too drunk. <laughs> huh? It's a quarter wave. Uh, it's a quarter wave formula. So it's uh, the number three. Well, yeah, but you have to know the wavelength. You have to know the exact wavelength. Oh, but there's there's actually a rule of thumb specifically, and I think the number three hundred is involved, isn't it? Huh? Plus your age. Plus your age, yes. You'll have, to, you'll have to excuse me. I was out partying real hard last night, so uh, I'm not the most uh, coherent this morning. So that's why I'm depending on my laptop here with the notes. Um, no, they're changing. They're changing them because Radio Shack, over the last, I just just my own internal knowledge of Radio Shack's policies after working there for like five years. Um, Radio Shack has changed vendors for their antennas a couple of times. They're now using an entirely different Japanese or Chinese factory than the one they were using five years ago. So the changes are just they're purely cosmetic. And the inside, the antennas are identical electrically. Um, they also wanted to make them look a little less cheesy. And they ended up making them looking a little more cheesy, but you know, that's Radio Shack. Um, another antenna that a lot of people have had success with, but I've never used, Radio Shack sells a scanner antenna, um, which is a magnet mount antenna like this. In fact, they have a discontinued version you can get for like two or three bucks now um, that has three it uh, has like two loading, little loading coils on it. It's designed to be a scanner receiving antenna and also a transmitting antenna for ham radio. Um, I've heard those antennas work out of the box, but have a 25 watt power limitation. Um, I've never tried them. TP, uh, did you ever try one? I've, I've never tried them. Um, I, there's no reason why they shouldn't work. If they work on the two meter ham band, they can probably be tuned, worst case scenario. Um, yeah, so that's that's the next thing is that there's a couple of different. These are great 
mobile installation, you stick it on the top of your roof, you drive to the top of a mountain, you talk for 15 minutes or 20 or an hour and you leave. Nobody's the wiser. A little more permanent installation, you're probably going to want to go with um, either a, a, a straight dipole design, which uh, there are actually instructions to build on uh, uh, Freeway Your Berkeley site, which uh, I might as well give that out now since I'm looking at it. It's a www.freeradio.org. And uh, they have a couple of different designs. Um, we've used in the past a J-pole, which is basically kind of a folded dipole style. Um, the only problem with the J-pole that we've experienced is it's got a really bizarre radiation pattern. Um, yeah, and it's about 14 feet tall. So uh, you can imagine what that looked like in the back of a Toyota pickup truck. Um, and there's pictures. We have the pictures. Um, you can also build what's called a, but you can also build a, a Yagi antenna or even a little more simpler dipole for a flat dipole with maybe a director, which is a little, little simpler Yagi, which is just a two element Yagi. Um, probably the best resource to, um, to do, and this is something that I suggested, that I would suggest to anybody that's interested in micropower radio, is to go to a ham radio store and uh, pick up a couple of books printed by the ARRL. Uh, which is the big ham radio club in the United States. Um, one of them is called the AWRL Handbook. It's a big, thick book like this big, and it's uh, got lots of stuff you don't need, but it also has a lot of stuff you will need. Um, it's got lots of formulas and tables and flotsam and jetsam and how to, how to talk to Mars on 10 meters and all that kind of stuff. But it also has a lot of antenna designs that you can look at and do the math yourself and apply those designs to the FM broadcast band. Um, there's also a couple of antenna designs in there that you can reapply to the AM broadcast band, um, which is uh, also a very interesting place to do business. Um, another book that you uh, might want to pick up while you're at the ham radio store is the is it the AWR Antenna Handbook? Is that the right name or Antenna? I think, it's, I think it's called the Antenna Handbook. It's got pictures of huge antennas on it. You can't miss it. It's a lot thinner, and it just talks about antennas. Nothing else. Um, that's also a very good resource. Um, there's also another book, while I'm talking about books, I'm kind of rambling, so, so anybody stop me if I'm not covering something you want to know about. There's also another book that is actually co-authored by Stephen Dunifer, and you can buy through the FRB, called uh, Seizing the Airwaves. It's 13 bucks uh, plus $3 shipping, and I have the address if anybody's interested. Um, or you can go to their website, freeradio.org, and buy it. Um, it's a little less technical than some of the AWRL books that I mentioned. Um, it's a lot more introductory. So if a lot of what I'm talking about is kind of going over your head and you don't know what I'm talking about, it's probably a good place to start. Um, yeah, but as far as a Yagi goes, the only problem with a Yagi is a Yagi is going to be directional. So if you live like on a mountain and there's like a desert behind you and a five million person city on one side, that's probably a good choice because you're not going to be talking to nobody. But for most people, they're sitting in the middle of a, of a, of a neighborhood. They want to cover a pretty, you know, good circle around, you know, in an equal proportion. Um, a Yagi isn't always the best choice. Um, because people five blocks that way will hear it, but people five blocks that way won't. And it all depends on what your target is. That's probably a good, just just general idea to try to figure out where the people you want to, want, you know, you think you're, you don't want to hear are, and then try to put yourself in the middle. <laughs> um, it makes no sense to put a techno pirate radio station in the middle of a middle class, you know, an upper middle class white suburban neighborhood. Um, similar, similarly, I, I don't think I'd want to put an easy listening station in the middle of uh, downtown Santa Ana or Los Angeles. I probably wouldn't get a lot of listeners. Um, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else here. Um, as far as transmitter designs, um, We've used in past years. We've used the, the like I said, the Panaxis Exciter plus the FRB uh, amplifier. It's worked very well. The design is very simple. It's easy to build. Um, it takes a couple of afternoons to put the whole thing together and get it tuned up. Um, and uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. Uh, I've done this so much now in the last five years. It's like. <laughs> 
Oh, um, the best place, okay, yeah, places to get technical assistance on the net. The, uh, the, uh, the, the easiest place to get technical assistance is, um, is it alt.radio.pirate. I think, is the exact news group. There's also a mailing list, which off the top of my head I can't remember, but um, if you email me, and I'll give out my email address at the end, I'll send you the, uh, the, the email list. I think it's like microradio at TAO dot CA. It's in Canada somewhere, so it's got like a really weird, um, really weird thing. Um, you can also get a little bit of technical information, although it will take six to eight weeks from Free Radio Berkeley, um, either through freeradio.org or they have an email address on their website. Um, you can also contact um, us directly. Um, I'll give you my email address. It's fetal, that's F as in Frank, E E, D as in David, L E, at radioinvasion.com. That's all one word run together. And uh, did you want to give out your address? The other person that is, uh, we've, uh, he's actually the one who's actually engineered everything. It's, uh, is it T-Pagan or is it Technopagan? Technopagan at mailcity.com. And uh, that's also a good place to go. Um, I, I also have a page that um, I have on my laptop. I haven't uploaded it yet. Um, I'll go give you that web page. It's www.661.org slash the tilde character fetal and slash uh, micro radio. Or you can just, if you don't forget that far, if you just get to my website somewhere and navigate, it's probably under, going to be end up being under uh, projects, Micropower Radio. Um, I have also a document that I wrote up for last year's con convention, which I can put up there, which is a lot more um, specific about a lot of the things I just kind of glossed over. Um, in fact, that's kind of what I'm reading right here. <laughs> um, and uh, also has a specific um, des antenna design. It has in that document the, the J-pole design that we've used previously. Um, that's about all I have to say. Uh, unless anybody has any questions, I'll just uh, start there. Yeah. Um, how do people get caught? I mean, it it's a good... Or? Yeah, that's actually a very good thing to talk about is getting caught. Um, usually the easiest way people get caught is uh, their neighbors can't suddenly pick up channel 5 on their TV set and um, they get like 10 complaints in a five block area and it all seems to involve one channel that involves this really bizarre music that nobody's ever heard of before. Um, typically who will catch you is not necessarily the FCC. Who will typically catch you is um, an SWL, a shortwave listener, or a ham radio operator, who happens to be a friend or a relative of Joe Bob down the street that can't pick up Channel 5. Um, the easiest way to avoid getting caught is to not create interference. Um, this is a very, this is a big issue for a number of reasons. One of them being that the FCC's big complaint about micropower stations is that they cause all this awful, horrible interference to, you know, they tell these doomsday scenarios of airplanes falling out of the sky and police not being able to pull up criminal records on people and things like that. Um, on freeradio.org, there's a couple of designs for interference filters that you can build to put on your transmitter so that your transmitter doesn't create spurious emissions and things like that. It's strongly suggested that you use it. You much, I personally and a lot of other people in the micropower radio movement would rather you have a weaker, st weaker signal that doesn't interfere than a powerful one that you know, keep some plane from landing at John Wayne Airport um, because that'll get you taken down faster than anything. But uh, typically, the, the everybody's scenario of the magic station wagon driving through downtown LA looking for the pirate radio station isn't typically how it works. Typically how it works is a ham radio operator will write up a complaint letter to the FCC stating power levels that he's observed on frequencies that he doesn't believe to be licensed. He'll send that into his, he'll either send it into the FCC office in Gettysburg or he'll just call his local FCC office uh, and uh, fax it over or deliver it to them some other way. And uh, if the ham has done his homework, the FCC will, all the FCC will do is just generate a carbon form letter that they generate to everybody, mail it to the person in the cease and desist order. Um, if they're in a particularly aggressive mode, they might send a couple of agents by to knock on the door and say, knock it off. Um, 
The FCC doesn't carry firearms, so they tend to be very cooperative the first time around. Uh, they tend to only come in with firearms and lots of jackbooted thugs if they've asked you to knock it off and you don't. Um, my advice would be is if you get two people on the door in a suit and they claim they're from the FCC and they tell you to turn your station off, you might want to turn your station off. <laughs> Um, that was our experience with uh, Free Radio Bakersfield, which is uh, where I am now. Uh, we basically had the FCC come and just tell us to knock it off, and we did, and that was all we ever heard of it. Um, you mean like uh, using like repeater communication, like, am like using actually amateur communication? Um, what what a lot of state what a lot of stations have done is they've invested in um, free you know, other free radio services like. FRS or uh, Citizens Band, and I've used that. You, you, you know, broadcasting from a remote location is always an option, but the thing is, is that if you throw your transmitter up in the mountains and you're sitting down here at your house and you're beaming to it, um, the FCC finds it, they now can just go, oh, it's on this frequency, and then find you on that frequency. Um, I don't know if anybody has had a lot of luck doing it successfully because there's all kinds of variables. Um, by all means, if, if you want to try something like that, go right ahead and report the results and maybe you can talk about it next year and I won't have to come up here and uh, make an idiot of myself. The primary consequence of getting caught is that uh, they'll come take your stuff away. Um, there's also a fine involved, typically uh, a number with three or four zeros after it uh, per day. Uh, they tend to not use that because, uh, as for micropower stations, because they've had in previous years some political nightmares with doing that for, you know, they, they, there was an incident involving a, a couple of high school kids at a high school back east that, that got the whole community in an uproar. Um, they will do that if they feel that there's an egregious violation going on, um, like if the content is particularly obscene or is um, been ongoing for quite a long time or they feel there's other issues involved, like for instance you are indeed interfering with, with legitimate communication, especially public safety. They get really upset with public safety and aircraft. Um, so typically, yeah, there, there are serious consequences for, especially if they knock on your door, send you a letter, and you continue. Um, I've heard of 8,000 to 10,000 a day fines being hand out, handed out for micropower violations, which is silly considering that most of these stations are less than 5 watts. You can't be received for more than 5 miles. But that's the political scene. Anything else? Yeah. Have you ever gotten some of the vicinity in Yes. They, they, uh, specifically, um, a station in, um, Miami that was taken off the air in the last round of busts back in, back in summer last year. Uh, the station was particularly targeted specifically for obscenity. And, and in fact, th what, how they ended up taking the guy down was not the FCC. It was the local sheriff's department enforcing obscenity law. So, yeah. Yeah, this is in Dade County. Weird things happen in Dade County. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there's a there's a series of uh, kits, the FM10, FM25, and FM100 kits from a company by the name of Ramsey Electronics out of uh, Victor, New York, I believe, or Ramsey, New York. They're in New York State. Um, the FM10 is a great transmitter to play with and to give to your little son and say, here, play on the FM dial, but it's not a very good broadcast transmitter. Um, its frequency is unstable. It has some interference issues when you try to put an amplifier on it. And um, just isn't generally a good transmitter. The chip, it's basically based on a, a common chip called the BA-1404, and that chip is the kind of thing that's used in Mr. Microphone. So, uh, it, it's not a very, it's not a, it, it's a great design for what it is, but it's not anything more than what it is. Um, the other two transmitters that Ramsey makes, the FM-25 and the FM-100, are a different story. The FM-25 is a stable transmitter. Um, it's not a bad transmitter. I would prefer, you know, personally, I, I got one and I didn't think it was 
as good as the Panaxis trans as the Panaxis transmitter. It's about the same power level. Um, they are very easy to build. They do provide some support if you're having trouble constructing it. Um, if you're a novice in constructing kits and have never done it before, um, that's a good place to go. They also sell the FM25 as an assembled kit, so you don't have to assemble it yourself. It's more expensive that way. I think they want about $210 or $220 assembled. The third transmitter that Ramsey makes is the FM100, which they legally cannot sell in the United States. However, if you've got a friend in Mexico or are really good at cheesing them up, you can get them to send you that transmitter. That transmitter is actually a professional exciter. It is designed to be used as a low-cost exciter for a commercial transmitter. As such, it is extremely stable, it is extremely reliable, and has very good good audio quality. Um, it does have the problem of not being legally available in the United States. If you can finagle that, it's a good transmitter. Yeah, they, it, it all, they, they, yeah they, I've, had, I've had issues there. I did get them to send it to a mail drop. There have been times. The, the, Ramsey constantly gets FCC people looking over their shoulder all the time. So if you just happen to call on the day that the local field inspector is out there just having coffee with the owner, you might not be so lucky. Um, yeah, he, what he was saying, for those of you who didn't hear in the back, that um, a lot of times they will ship it if you just send them a letter stating that you are going to export it. When I tried that, they required an exporter's license, which I was able to produce because I was actually exporting it, ironically enough, for a friend who lives in Japan. But uh, go fig. Well, legal to own is, is always kind of an iffy issue when you're talking about communications gear in the United States. Um, it, it's it's, 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 it's kind of like owning a red box. Depending on who you talk to and what phase of the moon it is, it's legal to have it or it's not legal to have it because it's an access device. Um, transmitters are kind of the same way. Technically, yes, it is legal to own a transmitter, but you're always going to get the question asked of you, well, why do you have it if you're not using it? It is perfectly legal to put as much power as you want into a non-radiating dummy load and talk away to your heart's content. Because of that, technically, owning a transmitter is not illegal. However, if your local field inspector just happens to be driving by and having coffee and he hears a radiation and he goes and stops by your house and you have an FM100 with a 1000 watt push-pull you know, transmitter there and no dummy load, that's not going to look real good. <laughs> yeah. I think the FM100 stock comes with like a 5 or 25. I think it's, it comes with a couple of different configurations if I remember right. Do, do you remember it? Yeah, I, I remember there being a 5 and a 25 watt configuration for the FM100, which is um, more than enough power to drive a, a, a Tetrode-based commercial broadcast um, transmitter. Most exciters are in that power range, so that's what it's designed for. It's also not type accepted in the United States for purposes of a broadcast uh, <laughs> exciter. Can you talk about the uh, FCC laws regarding the FM or uh, low power uh, FM? Uh, are we talking about low power AM yet? Okay, technically there is a loophole in the AM law that does allow a certain amount of low power broadcasting. Um, it is entirely different than FM. The FM rules are a really convoluted mix-up that says you can only you can only transmit a signal that is hearable at one millivolt per meter measured at three meters distance which for all practical intents and purposes means that you bought an FM10 at Radio Shack or at uh, Fry's, you put the little stock whip antenna, you're running it off a 9 volt battery and you can basically cover your property with it. Um, in AM, the rules are a little bit different and I don't I'm not the one to ask about this, but there are circumstances where AM micropower broadcasting is not only legal, it is technically encouraged by the FCC. An excellent example of this is um, in many parts of big cities, like in LA, for example, there are billboards that say tune to 1620 AM, and uh, you tune and you get some obscene, or not obscene, but some ridiculous commercializing content for, you know, this is, uh, this is, you know, my auto parts store, come and stop by, that kind of thing. Um, also, there's a lot of places where real estate agents are using them to sell houses. You know, for every, all the information on this house, listen to 1620 AM. Um, most of those, I think the power level that they're allowed is something like 100 milliwatts ERP. Um, 
which is not a lot of power. But uh, there have been some very curious applications of that law. There's a gentleman who uh, runs a uh, car dealer in central northern California, I think it's outside Stockton, that has a micropower AM station that is hearable for quite a distance and has a lot of people up in that area very upset because it's uh, causing other problems. But uh, yeah, that's something that I don't really know a lot about. You can look around on the net, though, and get some answers. There is a certain amount of legal power that's permitted for AM, AM broadcast, just like FM. But there's also some special stipulations about schools and AM, from what I remember. If you're on a school, you can do all kinds of stuff. Any other questions? Okay, um, again, it's www.661.org slash tilde fetal slash micro radio, and uh, that page should be up as soon as I arrive back in the beautiful city of Bakersfield, California. Um, <laughs> so, and uh, I guess that's it. There's a staff member here who looks like he's ready to kick me out, so I guess I better. Oh, you're just sitting here to. Oh, you just came for the talk. Well, you missed it. And you missed it. So, anybody else has any questions one last time? Anybody else want to know anything I didn't cover? Yeah. Um, well, you can broadcast legally on the FM band if you follow the millivolt per meter rule, which is effectively no power, or have $500,000 you can post as a bond to the Federal Communications Commission to apply for a Class C commercial broadcast license. Um, that's the minimum investment. It gets a, it, that's like how much you have to spend to talk to the FCC, basically. And um, there's mo you have to po use that money to have engineering surveys done and this and that and everything else for purposes of setting up a broadcast station. Um, like I said, in the beginning of the talk, I talked about there, there is an attempt to try to get a proposal through the commu commission right now called the LPFM docket, which is currently a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, which is kind of like the FCC version of a bill in Congress, if you will, um, that will permit micropower broadcasting under 1,000 watts. Um, and that's wandering its way through the FCC. If you want to comment on it, which I suggest you do, you go to the FCC's website, look for it, and you have to get your comments in before August second. No, the, that was disposed of because in many cities, in many major markets, um, the the reserved band is used. The, the, they, they dropped all that 15, 20 years ago. Um, there are commercial stations down there. There are educational stations that have wound up, you know, higher up in the band because of trading with commercial stations and all kinds of other stuff. So, uh, my understanding is that's been dropped from the proposal. Is there anything in the proposal to keep uh, a commercial company with a law of money from buying all the frequencies? Um, there is a stipulation in the proposal, and I haven't looked at the proposal. There, there's, there's, the proposal has changed a lot um, over the last six months. Um, originally, it was one thing, and it's kind of changed into something else. Um, the FCC's intent with this proposal is to not create is to, is to create non-commercial stations. So the FCC is being very specific in their wording to prohibit or restrict ownership from large commercial interests. Um, the problem with this is that the FCC has traditionally been very friendly towards educational establishments. So a lot of people are worried that what may end up happening is that they're, like with the previous low power FM in the 70s, the only thing that will end up happening is schools will end up snapping up all the licenses and broadcasting commercial formats on a, you know, on a, on a, on a non-commercial station. A case in point is in Long Beach, there's a jazz station that is run by the University of California and nobody can compete with it because it's commercial free. Because it's a, it's a non-commercial, it's a, it's a educational license. So, that's, that's a concern. I suggest you read the, you get the proposal and read it because there have been some changes. Um, it's on FCC's website in like a 50 gazillion different formats. I think it's, they've got it in like WordPerfect and uh, uh, a text file. They got an Acrobat file. They even have like Excel spreadsheet attachments for a lot of the a lot of the stuff. The FCC's gotten surprisingly wired over the years. Um, so uh, that 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 would probably be the best if you're interested in that proposal. Um, like I said, there's actually two different classes of stations. There's currently a thousand watt and a hundred watt license, and I think a lot of the licensing is going to be Obviously, if you want the 1,000 watt license, they're going to be a lot more anal than if you just want the 100 watt license. So, at least that would be the hope.
any last questions? Okay, well, that's it. I don't know who's next. Um, thanks, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being totally.